sort of stopped our, our descending tracks. We've gone all the way back to the motor cortex and, and stopped. But if that's all we had, it would be as though we had visual agnosia for, for, the, um, for, for movement. In other words, primary motor cortex is absolutely necessary for volitional movements, but it's certainly not sufficient. And I, I want to illustrate that by showing um, a, a cartoon that I put together of what, what happens if you zap, if you excite, if you electrically stimulate in the primary motor cortex. And this has been done. I'm not making this up. This has been done a lot. It was done by, it was really uh, pioneered by Wilder P Penfield and um, his colleague Rasmussen. So, and they published a book, which is uh, real, very entertaining reading. And, and, and they were doing this in, uh, during neurosurgical procedures in which they had to map in order to make sure that they weren't going to uh, disrupt um, needed functions, and most importantly, uh, speech. And so they, they mapped the cerebral cortex of, of the human um, through a whole years and years of neurosurgical procedures. And what they consistently found was that when they stimulated in primary motor cortex, there was something moved. And, and then they asked the patient about this, and what the patient did was to not own the movement. They say, oh, my hand wanted to move. So it, they, they basically deputized their, their muscles with, with desire. It moved. They had to make an explanation for it, but they did not own the movement. It, the movement did not come from them. And that is, that's the case with this motor, primary motor cortex. It doesn't come from them. One of the early, um, uh, so then you think, well, where does the, the initiative to move come from? And one of the early uh, fMRI studies that was really revealing um, so beautiful, um, asked people to make a, 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 a sequence of finger movements. So one, three, five, two, four, something like that. Okay. So when they just did that sequence, if they just did one uh, finger movement, they got activation in primary motor cortex. If they did this sequence, they got prim activation in primary motor cortex, but also in an area up here, which we now uh, call supplementary motor area. And if then they ask the person to say, okay, don't make the move, movement, but just imagine making the movement. And as they imagined, they did not get any activation in primary motor cortex. They got activation in supplementary motor area. So supplementary motor area is a place where you plan, you think about it. You think about, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit that ball. I'm going to hit a home run. I'm going to make a, a serve. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to catch that ball. So you plan a movement. You think about it. You rehearse it. You do that here even without engaging the final, um, the, the final bottleneck that gets you out of the cerebral cortex and down to the, to the motor neurons. The supplementary motor area is very important for self-initiated uh, movements, whereas the premotor cortex is a little bit more, uh, is biased towards movements that are in response to, to external stimuli. So if you, if you want to paint a painting, supplementary motor area. If you're um, unlocking a bunch of, of, of locks, and you're, you're supposed to unlock all the red locks, that's more premotor cortex. You're, you're responding to the, to the um, sensory world. And then, Besides these extremely volitional movements, there are also movements that are emotionally, uh, emotionally motivated. And one of them is laughing at a funny joke. We talked about that before. And that comes from um, uh, areas that are not in motor cortex. So motor cortex is, is not involved in initiating these emotional movements. One of the places that is, is, is an anterior cingulate. Now, when you wince in pain, it is an unconscious reaction. It is an emotional action. So corticobulbar tract lesions are not going to uh, uh, affect, they're not going to harm 
emotional a actions. They're going to harm volitional ones. Okay. So when we go back, when we go back to this slide or this view, the motor cortex is involved in volitional movements. Emotional movements take a pathway that is goes through extrapyramidal, not corticospinal cortical bulbar tract, extrapyramidal pathways. They get, to the, they get to the motor neurons, they make a move, but those extrapyramidal pathways and the path that they take is very poorly understood. One more uh, movement problem that I want to leave you with, and this is ideomotor apraxia. This stems from an, uh, an inability to, to uh, it typically occurs with a left parietal lesion, and in this situation, there's information, remember that the left cortex, the left hemisphere is responsible for language and language comprehension in the uh, temporal parietal region, language production in the frontal region. So back here, there might be um, some, it, it, it somehow interfaces with language comprehension and an, an instruction, a command to make a movement cannot be followed. That's idiomotor apraxia. So I say, pour the water into the cup, and the person cannot follow that command. They cannot pour the water into the cup. Time passes, and they may want something to drink, and they pour the water into the cup. Self-motivated, they can do it. In response to a command, they cannot. So that's really these, diff these two different pathways, this very volitional, deliberate pathway that goes from language to um, the, through the cortical bulbar and corticospinal tract versus this more emotional, um, self-motivated, uh, extrapyramidal pathway traveling message. Okay, so we're ready to move on to the cerebellum. Yeah.